Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to TNO, the last of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mocha Lover, and right now, we have Restless Days. The stranger's entry into Cheetah was a surprisingly simple thing. The White Army soldiers who had stopped him at the border were more interested about news from the West than they were his identity. <clears throat> from there, he found himself following the road for a short time before entering the city of Cheetah. As he entered the city, he could sense attention building around him. Groups of soldiers glared at one another across the street. Men loyal to the Tsar were outnumbered by men loyal to the old White Army generals who ran the Principality. Yep, he could tell that these divisions were fresh, exceptionally so. This is something that he could take years to boil over. Deciding to put the tension out of his mind, the stranger walked down the streets until he came to a small hotel. Entering the lobby, he could see the other road-weary travelers sitting in, around the fireplace. Walking to the front desk, he ordered a room for the night and went to lay down. He took off his bulkier outer layers and lay down on the bed, and as he lay there, his hand wandered to his left side where burned scars could be seen dominating his flesh. The man thought back to the night he got them when he tried to play hero and finally followed his conscious for the first time in that darn war. It had ended with his body burnt and the body and the people who had tried to save dead. He was broken from his reminiscence by a scream coming from the ne room next door. Without hesitation, he had sprung from his bed, old service pistol in hand, and bashed in the door to his neighbor's room. Inside a man in a white armor uniform had pressed a young woman against the wall, his pants already around his ankles and a knife against her throat. He was barely able to turn before three shots rang out. The, <clears throat> the dude fell to the floor without a sound. The girl ran out of the room and downstairs, and he sprinted back into his room. He gathered his gear, opened the window, and jumped. He would have to find another place to sleep. Discretion is often the better part of valor. Well... Wasn't I was not expecting things to go like that with the first thing, uh, huh, first few minutes into the video. But okay, well, we have supposed war. I already did the war or the little um, attack, prepare the raid against uh, the Republic of Alden. So, suppose war. If you'd like to read about this, please go right ahead. But we've got a couple, got a couple comments to go through if I can pronounce my words correctly. Woo! A little more stability, a little more war sports, always very nice. And we're currently training new workers just because, well, our expertise. Not very good, but has Burgundy finally done it? Perhaps. <clears throat> now, we could be making her play, but maybe we'll go ahead and do all this stuff as well, just because, well, we can. And get more research speed. Research speed, 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 speed. Special training might not be bad. Daily, more daily armor XP gain. We can do, wait to do that one, probably. Even though I would like the extra division artillery. Infantry weapons, yeah. Get more war support like this. <clears throat> Any good military needs a well-motivated officer corps. We can pr promise them glory for the future, but for the moment, we need to promise them money. We, they are woefully underpaid and under-equipped, but those are, they lead are much worse off. They are requesting funds not to line their own pockets, but to provide their proper equipment to those that they command. The requests are noble and just, and surely the Tsar cannot s but see the wisdom ensuring that his loyal soldiers are properly equipped before they bravely face many, his and many enemies. Consequently, fundings or funds for this project will be added to our budgetary requests. We're going to be spending a lot of money. I wonder what the penalty is like if uh, when you just spend as much money as possible. That'd be interesting. But let's go with important Japanese surplus. Or maybe we'll do strategic theorem first. How about that? Cool. All right, offensive, we're going to go attrition planning. That's definitely the way we got to go. So, the Tsar is told that our industry, fledging as it may be, works day and night to produce the best equipment for soldiers. This is a polite fiction. In truth, we do not have the ca capacity to produce enough rifles, cannons, and ammo for the soldiers we have, let alone those that we want to recruit. During the years we spent in Habim, we made excellent use of equipment given to us by the Japanese. Manchukuo is just across Argun, and we have still many connections there. Importing a small amount of the vast stockpiles of Japanese arms scattered around the country should prove a simple task, but brotherly love, my friends. <clears throat> there was a little Vizarian Mustafin that could do to disguise his surprise when his little brother Leonid invited him out for drinks. While they'd been close as children, they drifted apart since Semenyov had led them into retaking of Cheetah, and they'd both been distracted by the countless duties. Something was up, something that Vizarian supposed that he'd find out once Alcalus loosened Leonid's tongue. Ah, this place really does have the best liquor in all the Far East. I'm certain of it, Leonid exclaimed, flashing the bartender a wide grin. Just because it tastes like water instead of fresh pee doesn't make it any good, Vissarion remarked with a chuckle. Leonid rolled his eyes and playfully pushed aside his brother. Ah, oh, you have too little faith, Vissarion, I'm telling you. I have a good feeling about the country's future, with Tsar Mikhail at the helm. And not that idiot old man, soon all the finery of the world will be around us, liquor included, of course. Laughing heartily, Leonid did not notice a frown upon his brother's face. That line about Semenyov had sounded almost treasonous. Say, Leonid, when this little brother turned to him, Vissarion... Continued, don't get yourself too involved in core politics, all right? Your good feelings are sometimes right, but so are my bad feelings, and, some, and I have a really bad feeling about the way things are going. Now, Leonid frowned and furrowed his brow. Maybe it can't hurt to just want a little bit more from the government, though, can it? I don't want to be a Japanese dog forever. Isn't there anything you desire for the country, brother? All I desire is your safety, which is a good thing to say. 
Let's get some more factories, shall we? And then we shall do a modern artillery corps. Two world wars have conclusively proven the superiority of artillery on the battlefield as a significant force multiplier. And this is one of the few principles that our older and younger officers both agree upon. However, the artillery we possess is both few in number and antique in manufacture. It may be expensive, but if we invest in a new and modern artillery corps, using our own customized designs and organization, we can ensure that we have the best artillery in Siberia. So, I did ask yesterday which country, Rush, or which Russian warlord was able to grab Manchuria. Or, you know, this part of Manchuria. And you guys said it was Amur, so I gotta play as Amur sometime. Led by Konstantin Rodzewski, but <clears throat> we'll get there down there eventually. I promise, someday. Uh, support artillery investments? Our officers plan to modernize our artillery is close to fruition. Working together, our older and younger officers have rapidly developed a detailed plan to completely overhaul our army's artillery in both doctrine and design. All that's left is to obtain the Tsar's approval. Tsar Mikhail knows how critical the military is and how much we've done. And how much blood we've shed for him. He won't refuse us. He cannot. Another comment. When will I play as Burgundy? Someday. Definitely someday. I promise I will play as Burgundy someday. Not sure when, but someday. Let's grab that. Because I'd love to grab all this extra land auction and war support. So, anything here? Investments? Planning? Eh, not too bad. Not too great, though. And are we going down the military path or the royalist path? Or, you know, the Mikhail path? Uh, at the time of this recording, I'll be honest, like, I just want to do another monarchist path, so we're going to go with Mikhail, uh, to the disappointment of some. It is what it is, but, uh, in the future, I'll play Cheetah again, and we'll go down the military path. I and mean, all these warlords that we play, there's a lot of different paths that we can choose, so, I really enjoy it. Unified Doctrine? Let's go do that one first. One of our greatest military struggles is the constant disagreement and the infighting between our officers regarding personal doctrines. Older generals call... Cling to the grand battle plans of the Great War, while younger officers propose concepts of combined arms. This paralyzes progress, and we can no longer be overlooked. A decision defining the future of our armed forces must be made. We will hold a conference, including both the oldest and most innovative officers, and presided over by, by the Tsar. With the eyes of the monarch upon them, they will finally decide upon a unified doctrine, which is a good thing. Oh, against the Supreme... Oh, boy. Yeah, against these guys? Oh, man. A union of letters. Uh, yeah, no, I think, I think we'll be okay against them. Yeah, let's not do that. Trainer troops, yeah, I need the extra manpower. We have none. Nice, we get a little bit of loot, and someone's probably going to attack us soon. Hopefully not too too much, but we'll see. Okay, special training. Modern warfare is dominated by the specialists, a soldier who is both trained in and experienced with tasks that no ordinary soldier will be capable of. We're surrounded by enemies, but the Tsar can be assured that our tribe can be guaranteed by transforming our soldiers into an army of specialists. Training relating to command decentralization, behind the lines operation sabotage, and much more, much more will be worked on in our soldiers' regular training regimens this, in this way. We can say that we will never be caught unprepared, which is good. And... Imperial Guard Divisions. Colloquially, our army is often referred to as the Tsar's Finest, a nickname intended to give pride to the many peasant conscripts making up our forces. But some officers have proposed making the name a reality, concentrating a handpicked group of the most loyal, most experienced, and most physically fit soldiers together and specialized units. The old Tsars had the Imperial Guard, elite infantry that could not only handle any task but also inspire others to greatness. It is only natural that Tsar Mikhail, the rightful emperor, has his own. Infrastructure would not be bad either. I like the infrastructure thing, so. Good. And we do have a cup of coffee here to keep us nice and warm in these cold April months. <laughs> or days, or weeks. Not a lot of events so far, which is actually okay with me. Just so we can kind of push ahead, because I don't know how, if we're really supposed to be taking this long to develop everything, but we'll see. After those, the Modern Warfare, which is a fun game. While distasteful, we must acknowledge that the Bolsheviks demonstrated innovations in modern warfare. Their application of it against the Germans might have been ineffective, but nonetheless set the standard for warfare across the vast expenses of Russia. War has changed, and it's clear that we need to invest in the mechanization and motorization of our army so that as to ensure that our soldiers are well equipped for the realities of Siberian com combat. Regardless of the protests of some of the older officers, our empire cannot afford to repeat the mistakes of its predecessors. Backwards thinking is to be discouraged at all costs. Good. Ah, uh, Amur. Actually, uh, how strong is Amur now? Two to four divisions. We do have four divisions as well. They do have a lot more manpower, though. I wish these guys had treasure. But, a lonely evening. The Tsar's palace is a lonely place, more so at night. When Mikhail had first moved in, things have been different. Early sleeps turn into early mornings, and you ever are hardly notice the hugeness and the emptiness of the place. But as days turn into months, that turn into years, things begin to change. Late, sleepless, silent nights blended into lethargic, lonely days. More and more alcohol was brought into the palace, and everyone knew who was consuming it. It bodyguards, sure, faceless, faceless children of emigres, but Mikhail knew we couldn't name a single one of them. 
One of the long sleepless nights, defined by Mikhail's wonders and regret, the powerless star sat in a chair overlooking a dark window. He couldn't see out of it. The street light outside was damaged, and the bright lights of the palace contrasted so deeply with the black night outside that Mikhail only saw his reflection. His mind wandered often, but often tonight, he would only think of one thing his father. He had never, er, never endorsed Mikhail's visit to Harbin. Even begging him not to go, Mikhail had attempted to write letters to his father many times with nearly a dozen letters written in total, and yet he lamented he had never received a single response. He had once been close to his father, but his de deafening sounds had further crippled Mikhail. With a glass full of liquor in his hand, he wondered why his father refused to respond. Was it to punish Mikhail for leaving? Or perhaps he had moved and not received the letters? A dreadful thought passed through the Tsar's mind. Maybe his father didn't care to respond at all. He finished the brown liquid in a single belt. The first of many, he was sure. Mikhail missed his father, he missed his home and his family. His mind shifted to one thing, another letter. Tonight, the Tsar writes a final letter. Cool. Poor old Mikhail. Must be sad, lonely existence for him up here, but modern warfare. Shall we? Oh, look at that. Another division. This point, we have one. It's just better to have more divisions than... Some really good divisions right now. Ooh, these guard divisions, though, that's not bad. And they're not special forces, so... Go with one more, maybe? Nah, we'll do that. Yeah, uh, com we'll convert our divisions to be like this, actually. How many artillery pieces do we have? 420, that's not bad. Yeah, that's not bad. Uh, infantry equipment, though? But that's not bad either, look at that. Nice. I like this. Do we have any support equipment make being made? No, we do not, which sucks, but whatever. Alright, after Modern Warfare, the Far East Finest. Our military is barbarian. Very few of our soldiers and younger officers have spent time west of the Urals, but this is a strength. If they can survive and thrive here, of all places, then they can do anywhere. If we incorporate their knowledge and values into our standard training, we can transform our collection of conscripts, emigres, and vagrants into the Far East Finest, a disciplined force seemingly vulnerable to the cold and inescapable, or capable of remaining organized in even the worst of weather. The Tsar wouldn't want it any other way, and we're sure of it. Far East Finest, nice. Scams for loot. Can we beat these people up? Nope. And nothing else. The Tsar's finest. Yeltsov stood at the ready, his face betraying nothing as he stood in the full uniform, side by side with 50 other men, in front of the Tsar Mikhail II. In reality, behind the stoic face of loyalty was a mind filled with excitement. <clears throat> he, the son of a peasant, specifically selected out of thousands, no tens of thousands, to be a member of the Imperial Guard. Yeltsov, a man who mere years ago had been a private, eating bottom barrel food not fit for a rat, was now the man who had guarded Tsar, guard his Tsar with his life. Then suddenly the Tsar was there, stepping out on the top of the palace's tall steps. <clears throat> A newfound energy possessed him, and he wanted to desperately yell his loyalty to the man who would be the Tsar of all Russia. Subjects began the Tsar, his voice clearly held by all the men in attendance, I am. For a couple of seconds, there was silence where inspiring words should have been, here to say that. Yeltsov had an instinctual need to see the face of its fellow guards, but he knew better than to do that in front of the Tsar. But still, he couldn't be the only one who finds this strange. The speech, if you could call it that, continued for another five minutes, although it was based off actual content. Yeltsov guessed it would have been a minute at the most. Occasionally, the Tsar stumbled over his words before correcting himself, clearly embarrassed. But the gist was was obvious. He, Yeltsov, was a member of the Imperial Guard, tasked with protecting the Emperor with his life. And for that, Yeltsov was glad to be part of it. Perhaps we should have let someone else speak for him next time? Um, oh, we can't raid against these guys then. Actually, how strong is Magadan? Because they're not probably too weak. 3,000 map. Uh, they're not that bad, not bad. Uh, let's kill each other off, and hopefully Magadan loses, but I'm pretty sure Amur is going to lose. Cool, the fire is finest. Now, we might not be actually be able to go to war with Amur just because I'm taking my sweet booty time with this, so. No, don't lose, guys. Actually, it's going to take a while for them to lose, so. Nice. Um, I'd like to raid, please. Please. Oh, look at that. We actually have a free civilian factory. Do we actually build things here? Oh, look at that. We actually built all the infrastructure here. Nice. We build that too, why not? <clears throat> Far East Finance and making your play. Oh, oh boy. With well, our civilian industry taken care of and growing, our borders secured with the defense schemes in place, then the military's pressing needs to attend it too. We can finally look outwards and begin the process of finishing what we should have done years ago. The sympathetic or systematic destruction of the Russian fascist party and its thugs. Now is the time. We can capitalize on the squabbling, destroy the party, and recover the territory that we worked so hard to conquer when the Union collapsed. <clears throat> The Bolsheviks couldn't destroy us, neither could the fascist betrayal. Now that we're able, we can finally display the strength and endurance of the true white movement. Cool. Hey, we can do this. Cool. And anything here? That's barely going up. Research facility needs to go up. Agriculture is slowly going up. Equipment. Uh, mm, basic mechanization. Recruitable population factor. Less consumer goods. We get 10% more, which we could uh, honestly probably use. You know what? I'm going to go with agriculture Again. Research facilities are not bad, they're just not super important right now. 
Cool. Oh, a more did get encircled. Oh boy. The Dread Riders. The RFP troops stationed along the border with the Principality West of Madachi have grown lax, frequently posing, posting watches only several hundred meters away from their outposts. It was not seen by either of them, or their officers. As a significant problem, the neighboring white army formations could fight well enough, of course, but they rarely attempted special maneuvers. So the sounds of galloping horses began echoing through the small valley that the outposts rested in. They were first they were at first confused. They then realized far too late that the sounds were both too loud and coming from the wrong direction. When the contingent of white army cavalry broke out of the tree line, immediately overrunning the two close pickets and galloping towards the outpost at breakneck speed, the RFP officers tried in vain to prepare defense, but there was just not enough time. Those few troopers already on duty could not believe their eyes the cavalry advanced despite their great speed and perfect echelon, with no subunits becoming separated or fragmented. As they approached an outpost perimeter, they expertly divided, with the main force leaping over the poorly maintained wire obstacles and smaller ones circling around both the flank and prevent escape. The result was carnage. Utter, utterly overwhelmed, the cavalrymen slaughtered the RFP, either where they stood or as they tried to flee in terror from this unexpectedly proficient enemy. When it was all over, both the outpost itself and the intelligence contained within had been secured for minimal casualties. When the cavalry departed back westwards, they burned the outpost to the ground, sending the message that the White Army was no longer as ill-disciplined as the RFP itself often was. It was a real professional force and with tactics to match, as they tended to move to prove in the increasing fashion. We ride, they fall, good times. That could be tube computing, very nice. Even more research speed. It's helping us like research things 10 days faster when it takes 200 days of research, so it's not too bad. Making our play, we get more stability, which is very, very beneficial. We get 1.18 political power every day, not bad. Not bad. Actually, if we want to do, we can probably lower this by one then. There we go, now we can do this. <clears throat> Making our play. Ah, prepare to read out systems and war on the horizon. Yes, please. Mikhail stood outside the door. The crack in which allowed the voices within to be clearly heard. His journals were holding a meeting with the, and the Tsar felt that it would be impolite to interrupt, feeling content to remain just outside and listen. The unmistakable voice of General Leonid Mustafin spoke first. I'm not overly concerned about the fascist militias, but I underest or I understand. Mikhovsky has recruited a large mercenary force. They're experienced fighters and could be a real problem for our soldiers. Other the general's words, which seemed to imply conflict was about to begin, Mikhail couldn't help but begin to worry. Was war really coming so soon? A second distinctive voice, that of Boris Shepunov, the army's chief of staff, spoke next. I disagree, Leonid. Mercenaries want to fight bandits, not real armies. When they see our soldiers, they'll scatter to the wind and lead the fascists to their fate, and that rabble won't stand a chance against their foes. Mikhail felt his heart sink. His suspicions were correct, and regardless of what he might want, his little realm was going to war. He tried not to think about all the ways it could be go very poorly for him, trying so hard, in fact, that he accidentally pushed the door open. Well, that's all very good, said a third figure, that of General Vladimir Abramov, but we still have no place for the occupation of these territories. How do you propose we surprise at the appearance of their sovereign? Abramov trailed off as all the generals turned their attention to Mikhail. Shepanov was the first to speak. Your Imperial Majesty, we have exciting news. The pen is set aside and the sword shall be drawn. Settling accounts. It has been long, too long that we have let the fascists on the Amur and, the fest and beyond fester in the banditry and terror. We must prepare to settle our accounts, take the debts that we owe back, and liberate the people from this tyranny of the bandit king and his sluggish cronies. A widely publicized speech has been planned by Mikhail's supporters that all will be broadcast all throughout Chita via radio, where available TV. One of the very best to prepare for the oncoming conflict is not just to have our people support us, but also those that our enemies rule over as well. As such, it's imperative that we ensure copies of the speech degrading our enemies and the RFP as a whole get to those who need it to hear it in our rifle territories. Ultimately, truth is replaced by propaganda during wartime, and we know that our enemies aren't above doing the whole same shenanigan thing. Nice, Ikeda has one. Cool. Oh man, hopefully we're ready for war. But does Alden have any loot? I love looting, 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 shooting. Nope, that's all right. Nothing else here really. How's this coming along? Well, we need more manpower. We need about fourteen hundred more manpower. A little bit less than fourteen hundred. Oh, they made it in Sigma themselves. Magadan. It's not going to be super easy against them. Oh yes. Oh yes. Let's beat up these people. We have a total of six divisions. Verona Conference ends. Good luck or job with that. So, All right, setting the accounts and ready the troops. With our internal situation stabilized and our budget solidified, we can finally begin to look outwards and prepare ourselves for the conquest of the traitors of the Russian fascist party in Zeya and Magadan and beyond. The preparations won't be easy, and God alone knows how much effort and resources we will need to ensure that we are prepared for the brutal reality that is warfare in Siberia. However, 
If we are to have any hope of securing a future for the white movement here in the Far East, it is imperative that we have not just a functional but an effective army that will ensure that neither the fascist traders nor the Soviet successor states will challenge your dominance. Some of the generals, it's time for the military inspections and reviews. Oh, we got more manpower. Look at that. The calm before the storm, though, my friends. For a very long time, the poorly marked border zone between the Transbaikal Principality and the lands belonging to the Russian Fascist Party saw little traffic. That has changed, seemingly overnight. So our troops have established a formidable presence, constructing roads, ammo depots, and more, visibly and openly preparing for armed conflict. Corporal Fedorovich was no fool. He knew that these exercises were not for show and that his unit would soon be going into battle. He began smoking more to help calm his nerves, but he couldn't shake the knowledge that he might not live to see another month. Taking a hard drag and hearing footsteps as he did so, Fedorovich raised his head and saw his squad leader. Good morning. Corporal, the sergeant said, got a light. Fedorovich nodded, lighting the cigarette as asked. The sergeant looked to the east as he took a drag and took past a small creek that is substituted as a border market and towards the distant mountains. He gestured to Fedorovich. Over that river lies a land filled with hordes of angry fascists. Fedorovich remained silent as he followed the sergeant's gaze. I'm not going to lie, Corporal, it's going to be rough. They're going to throw everything they've got at us and we're going to take losses. There's no avoiding it, so prepare yourself while you still can. And as the time comes, make sure you take as many fascists down with you as possible. With that, the sergeant discarded the cigarette, gave the mountain... mountain one less luck, and made his way back towards the rest of the men. Fedorovich appreciated the small talk, but his anxiety had not waned. Death lay in, just, in wait just over the horizon, and the corporal wasn't ready to face it. The tension is overwhelming. Train our troops. Oh, is, is that really worth it? Eh, probably why not. And, ready the troops, and we'll read. And the barbarism, Magadan barbarism. The so-called banned king of Amur is little more than a broken, aging, pseudo-Nazi convinced of dying, decrepit ideology. This doesn't prevent him from being dangerous, however. Rumors from the east point to a massive series of purges that have been undertaken, tantamount to random killings in the streets and the public hanging of dissenters. Radzivsky tradi has traditionally been considered incredibly brutal, but his recent actions have proven that he's actually clearly unhinged and acting well past the bounds of civility. This barbarism and the crimes that he has committed against the Russian people must end the sooner the better. As such, we must prepare to move on the bandit and restore order under the true heirs of Habim. Surely, there will be too much resistance. After all, aren't his troops bu busy killing his own people? Alright, everyone, so we've beaten up Alden again, and we're slowly watching the death of Magadan. No, no, no. Amur. But, uh... I don't see any divisions down here taking out the capital, so... Maybe we got a little bit more time. Maybe. Maybe not. We'll see what happens. Hopefully we'll do pretty well. I mean, we do have six divisions. So, not too bad. We do have one loot, so that's pretty nice, I'd say. Uh, oh, never mind. Seven divisions. Make it seven. So, we're going to end the barbarism. Taking their place. Ooh, the Magadan Gamble. Uh, we might as well go with them as well. While Rodzewski's barbarism is bad, the pragmatic Metkovsky is no better. Based on the frigid port of Magadan, it's traditionally held to the rest radical than the Bannock King. But a less radical radical is still well radical. This one, at least, is smart enough to know how to adapt to the situations presented to him, and that makes him infinitely more threatening than a stiff ideologue residing in Zaya. Rumor has it that matkowski has been searching for foreign recognition and aid, even going so far as to position himself as a moderate candidate in the Far East. This cannot be allowed to continue for right now. The demand for foreign aid means that even the smallest amount could be the tipping point in the battle between the heirs of Habim. We need to act quickly, even, even if it... Overextends our armed forces. Attempt to end Metkovsky's regime before it stabilizes. It may be a gamble, but it's our best bet to secure our position. Let's move on in, boys, if we can. Um, go down to the capital, please. There you go. Should be able to win. There's only one division versus our three, so. Hopefully, if we're. F oh, boy. Fast enough. If we could take the capital, that would be actually really good. Maybe we'll get the territory so we can court. If they take it, it's no loss, really, because that means they lose. Maybe a little bit of manpower, maybe. But, um... Actually, we're gonna need some more fuel. Oh, boy. Yeah, we'll see. Actually, we'll definitely have to wait and see for this, so... I wonder who's gonna get the stuff. Because we're gonna kill them F anyway, so... Good! Army reserve training is done. Let's grab infrastructural reserve as well. Beautiful, and... Oh, they got it. God dang it, that sucks. Oh, come on, man. That sucks. That's alright. Um, equipment... Let's do research facilities, just because we need to probably do that. Top, stop that, so that's not bad. That's not bad. It should go up at least. I want everything to go up at least a little bit. Industrial expertise is going up slightly, slightly, slightly. So they can waste time trying to core stuff. Hopefully they spend their political power. A thousand manpower, look at that. Oh, we're mobilizing a little bit more too. Look at that. Nice. Come on, boys, get in here. Because basically we got to go back and kill them off anyways. Okay, then. Alright, let's see you guys. Good. I want you guys to help out here too. Uh, Can you guys... Where's our three... Oh, Oh, come on, they'd, they'd go all the way back there, that sucks. How, how many divisions do they have? Do they make any more? Three to seven. They do, might have some elite infantry, but we do have motorized, which is pretty darn nice. I want you guys to get out here immediately. And now this is not cores, and the, oh, maybe it is cores. Is it cores? Oh, Hitler's dead. That's a colony state, okay. 
Good, beat him up. Maybe I, mean, I should have used my motorized, but they're already attacking, so there's not much we can really do about that. Oh boy. Oh boy. Oh, we've been caught. We're so far, we're still winning, which is good. You boys should be able to get in there very quickly, right? Come on, move, 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 move. Oh, a little bit of lag. Ah, Germany's having a civil war. I love it. I love German civil wars. There we go. Good luck, guys. Have fun. Have fun. Good. Alright, so you guys gotta help out right here. And you guys are gonna go right here. Why? So we can circle these two divisions. Franco Burgundian War. I love Burgundy. I'll play them someday, like I said earlier. I promise I will. I just don't know when. Get her there to Ayan, and then go straight for Magadan. Um, yeah, you guys go in there. That's fine. You guys go there. Uh, don't worry about that. Head on over here. Thank you. Oh, god dang it. Oh, I guess you hold then. All right, divided. Cool. Let them struggle a little bit against us. That's fine. We have no manpower, but whatever. Come on, stop lagging game. Come on, mod. Oh, man, do you know lag so hard? It's probably the most intense. Well, maybe not the most intense mod. I mean, guys are actually lag pretty bad as, badly as well. Uh, come on. Come on. I know it's a river. Got to push those trucks over that water. Nice. Warsaw Uprising. Cool. English Civil War begins. Uh, send you guys down here, maybe. Nice. How many divisions? We've lost a thousand. We've lost a thousand. Four to six. All right. Oh, they're over there. Not bad. Not bad. Um. Hmm. Wait a minute, you guys go up there. Keep him, at, keep him at bay. Finally, you guys did it. Finally. You should be able to move very quickly into there, which is good, good, good. Hidden heroes. Nice. Uh, give you just a little bit more time. They want to come into there, which is totally fine with me. Formation of Africa Shield. Uh, screw it. Just go down there, maybe. You might be able to actually just be able to win anyways. Oh, look. They're trying to attack that way, huh? No, thank you. Serbs rise up. Hello, Serbs. Alright. What else do we have? We got plenty of political power, which is good, and we're going to keep it, hopefully, for now. You guys should be dying off because you don't have enough supplies eventually. Which would be a very bueno thing. Hey, look at that. Almost an encirclement. Almost. We're getting there. Just don't lose Zaya. Alright, no, 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 nope. You do that. There you go. South African War. My goodness, so many events. I really don't care to read all this stuff with everything happening, but it, we just kind of have to know what's going on here. Alright, very good. Help them out down here, actually. There you go. And they'll help them out down here. Hey, we killed that division off. Beautiful, my friends. Beautiful. Are you guys heading there? You just keep going on. Cut them off some more. Oh my gosh, game. Stop lagging. Please stop lagging. Nice. I'm glad we have the motorized. That actually does help out. Good. Yep, we overran one division. And we'll finish all those, those guys. Great. Oh, come on, man. Come on. Oh, actually, that's not bad. Maybe we'll do that and cut them off. There you go. These motorized are doing a great job. Come on, before they finish. Nice. There you go, my friends. We've got them. Kill them off before they reunite. Come on. And maybe you can still head up to Magadan. There you go. Nice. We've lost about 5,000 versus 31,000. Holy cow, that's a lot. Um, Actually, you go over there. That would guarantee their death, so. Anything else? Can we scavenge? Oh, yeah, scavenge really? Why not? Infrastructure, industrial investments. Oh, they landed in a How do you get up there so fast? From here to there? Holy cow, that is a bit extreme, I'd say. That's all right. Let our boy old move up. Move up, boys. Uh, I'm going to take you, actually, go here. Yeah, get him out of there. No port action for you, son. Alright, they're moving up. How many more divisions do they have? That was literally the last division. Port of Magadan captured. Uh, as the troops rush past the Far Eastern frontiers, their assault on the enemy troops was halted only by the sea. The Great Pacific, open and wide, and men after bloody battles, the Port of Magadan came under our control. The icy, choppy waters stretched for miles in every direction in front of them. The mysterious stretch of Siberian waters was home to by far the most significant port in the eastern Russian wastes. A hub of trade and smuggling. With a particular chance to Japanese American goods, the Port of Magadan opens up greater opportunities for administration and not only trade wares, but also make a name for ourselves across the globe. Indeed, with this invaluable port under our control, we pray to see our foot in the door to international recognition and trade. The gateway to Russia has been secured, thank goodness. Oh, now that's a capital, huh? Oh, wait, why is that the capital now? Oh, they must have court it, and maybe that's more victory points, perhaps? 
Keep going, boys. Where did their... Oh, they found their division. This is a, a little easier than I thought it would be. Nice, we got him. Beautiful. And now I'm glad I saved our political power because... Thank you. Prepare a raid against these guys. Uh, Yeah, that probably actually be really good to start preparing against these guys. Nice, my friends. We actually did a really good job there. Really, really nice. All right. Take their place. <clears throat> Slightly decrease scoring time. Well, it is what it is. Uh, infantry... Mercenary infantry, let's take their place. Now that we've secured the Amur region, we can evaluate the RFP's tools and figure out exactly what, should we, what, we, should, blah, 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 what we should keep. One of the few generally useful resources we've inherited from the Rodzewski is his context in Japan. While they're not exactly happy with the fact that we've toppled the Golden Bowl, the Japanese are nothing but pragmatic. They know that our administration would be immensely preferable to the resurgent Soviet Union. And even if their strategy would be to supply us in a futile attempt to keep Russia divided, we'll take all the help that we can get. Rifles, artillery pieces, trucks, or even bullets, whatever they're willing to sell, we're willing to buy. The arms merchants may be frosty at first, but we can bring them around to our point of view. A few veiled threats and a resurgent of a resurgent union, and the subsequent metaphorical flashing of our dollar bills will have them enamored. Oh, let's hope so, my friends. Supreme Soviet. Um, actually, for here, well, we can do this one. We want to keep building up our industrial base. Six and seven is not bad, and we do have what? Support equipment now. Nice. And early motorized. We're going to make some tanks soon enough as well. Very awesome. Look at that. We got some support equipment. From here, uh, let's see. We have. I'm going to make you into a better division. We have no manpower, but that's okay. Actually, how was the truck division? It's 16 combat width, which is not too bad, actually. Um, we could do some of this stuff. How much motorized do we have? Uh, we have enough, yeah. Motorized recon for now? Not a bad idea. And actually, can we make motorized artillery? Yes, we can. Can we make them into another one? Save a little bit more on trucks, yeah? Yeah? Nice. Very nice. Anything else here? Supreme Soviet raid. Infrastructure might not be bad. Uh, I'm going to train our troops, though, because I want more manpower. It's not much. It's really not much at all, but whatever. All right, take their place, and then top of the pedestal. Now that we've triumphed over Rodzevsky and his black shirt thugs, we need to begin the long process of destroying the memory of the Russian fascist party in his lands to integrate the area into our territory. Despite their barbarity and admi admiration for the German system, Rodzevsky ran a tight propaganda machine. The party's imagery and symbolism was everywhere. Clearly, the mad Zod himself wanted to emulate Hitler himself. From swastikas to large banners and anti-Jewish propaganda, the RFP's former capital Zaya was lousy with the party's symbolism. But that cannot be cannot stand. <clears throat> Mikhail aptly suggests toppling the pedestal, a process aimed at tearing down the RFP's propaganda and teaching the people that they no longer live under a reign of terror. We may have won the battle for the Amur, but the scars left from years of Rodzewski's rule means that the conflict is just beginning. I do somewhat apologize for speaking very, very, very fast. Just because, um... You know, we got to get through things somewhat quickly. But, Tokyo Calling. Foreign Minister Nikolai Utkomsky drummed his fingers nervously on the desk as he stared at the phone. It was late at night, and he had foregone sleep to await an extremely important telephone call that he knew was coming. The air in the room was tense, but the only sounds being that of his own, the owls outside. Utkomsky's fingers and the grandfather clock in the corner. Eventually, the telephone rang, and Utkomsky, Utkomsky sprang into action, immediately picking up the receiver. Ukutomsky speaking. Did you get her telegraph? The speaker on the other end spoke perfect Russian, but with a distinctly Japanese accent. I did, Ukutomsky replied, and I want to assure you that while the government and Zaya had changed, his, its intentions have not. The usual context will continue the arrangement as is, but they will now represent us. Is that acceptable? There was a long pause, and Ukutomsky struggled to keep his nervousness in check. We had a very specific understanding with previous parties, the voice said. Does your government intend to uphold its <clears throat> particulars? We do, unequivocally. Very well, we will do the same. The speaker on the other end abruptly hung up. Uk Tomsky leaned back in his chair and let her lay aside. The start of a beautiful friendship? Yes. And I guess from now on, we will probably start increasing our support from the Japanese, because the Japanese are cool people, right? We love the Japanese. Thumbs up from us. So, so much for developing our warlord era stuff and infrastructure, but we can build that naturally anyway, so... Not too concerned. I'm more concerned about coring stuff more quickly. We could raid, but attacking into... The and enemy territory might not be a great idea. They have up to six divisions. We have eight. They have plenty of manpower compared to us, so any attack we do will worsen our manpower pool currently. So I don't want to do that, but we have 37 days for that. Not too bad. Topple the pedestal, which is good. Happy 1964. We're already in 64. Nice. Uncover the caches, though, after we do some transistor computing. Nice, my friends. We're doing pretty darn well here. Let's keep building ourselves up with military industry, or... Let's do this one first. We'll get more output and cap and base, so that's pretty good stuff. 
uncover the caches. A theory that Matkovsky had already been receiving fairly large and significant foreign aid was apparently true. Upon the interrogation of a number of officers, quartermasters, and captured soldiers, we have learned that a number of supply caches have been scattered around Magadan by Matkovsky's branch of the RFP, some buried and hidden, to avoid capture by our oncoming forces. By promising amnesty to those who know the locations of these ca caches, we can have them bring them to us and dig them up like how guilty murderers would bring the authorities to where they stash the bodies. Our troops have always seemed to be short something. <clears throat> From artillery shows to winter clothing, and according to these interrogations, it seems that these caches have just about anything a soldier could dream of. Let's go find them. Cool. And we got some anti-tank and guns. Nice. Execution of Konstantin Razevsky. As it should be, my friends. As it should be. Alden. You, me, and Alden. Beating up the Aldenese. What could be more normal? <laughs> infrastructure would be nice, but I'd love to get more infantry equipment. But how much infantry equipment do we actually have? We have enough for now. Let's increase our relationship with them. Nice. Konstantin Rozevsky took one last look at his surroundings. His beloved Siberia was just as beautiful as it always was, and his captors couldn't have picked a finer day to execute him. On the journey to his place of execution, he had shouted himself hoarse, and all that was left, radiating from every feature, was rage. It was something his executioners, ex executioners could no longer see, or no doubt see. <clears throat> Rodzewski, do you have any last words? As a lead executioner spoke, Rodzewski turned his attention to the men who now had their rifles trained on him. Yes, I do. His sore throat struggled to form his words. Everything I did, I did for Russia. You can call me a monster, but soon the people realize that only monsters have the strength to save this country. Perhaps if I had killed that decrepit dude, Semenyov, and the rest of those forgotten relics back in Harbin when I had the chance, we'd find ourselves in a very different situation, yes? The demagogue p managed a pain, wheezing chuckle, and stood as straight as he was able. Go on, then. Make your weak star proud and shoot me already. A flurry rifle fighter... Rifle fire aptly punctured Rozinski's mocking final words, and the former fascist leader fell to his knees before pitching face first into the blood-stained snow. And with that, Rozinski's movement had concluded the very way it conducted itself all those years, with unrestrained, bitter violence. Perhaps there was some justice in the Russian Far East. National daddyism support goes way down. Fascism and liberal democracy and despotism? Oh, we love all three. Employment for the mercenaries. When Mitkovsky split the party, he also split the available manpower of the fascists, and he certainly got sh the short end of the stick. Rozevsky had either earned or bought the loyalty of a number of both senior and junior fascists. However, that didn't stop the pragmatic fascists from looking to other means to bolster his ranks. A number of mercenary companies were hired, and while we did best them in the battle, they're now stuck in frigid Siberia, no matter with no money. No master, no money. This situation presents both a danger and opportunity. Leaving them unemployed could result in disaster. A full-on revolt of professional soldiers that we simply cannot afford at the moment. But if we pay them to fight for us, well, it'll bolster our pitiful manpower pool and give us a powerful tool to use against our dangerous foes to the West. Besides, when has the use of mercenaries ever backfired? Hmm. Let's go in, my boys. Let's go in. A few tribute. Okay, very quickly. The Tribe of Mikhail Mikovsky. Um, let's see... Well, we do want to raise up. Uh, academic base is technically slowly going up. Everything is going up except for army professionalism and poverty. So let's do equipment, shall we? Tried and true equipment through and through. The trial of Metkovsky. Mikhail Alexeyevich Metkovsky, leader of the Russian fascist party, you've been accused of heinous crimes against Russia and her people. What can you say in your defense? For a moment, Metkovsky remains silent. He tried his best to maintain his composure to preserve some small shred of dignity, but the situation made it, rather, made it rather difficult. I wish to say that I never had my intention to cause harm to Russia. I only did what I thought was necessary to bring strength and unity back to this broken nation, and at the very least, I would argue that my government was far more legitimate entity than the sham of a trial. Mitkovsky almost immediately was showered with jeers from nearly everyone in the trial. He attempted to dodge the vegetables being thrown at him by the people in the gallery, but found it difficult with the guards restraining him. One of the prosecution, who almost entirely consisted of members of Cheetah's general staff, used this opportunity to lash out Lasha at him. Mr. Metkovsky, as I'm sure you are aware, your father died bravely fighting with us against the Bolsheviks during the Civil War and what his son has accomplished. Standing here accused as a war criminal and a fascist tyrant? Mit Mikhail Alexeyevich, you are a disgrace to your father's legacy and a disgrace to our movement. I would go as far as declare you are undeserving of wielding the very name of Metkovsky. He, who was still preoccupied with the objects being hurled his way from the gallery, scoffed at this accusation. That's ridiculous, how dare you? Before our moods could flare any further, the judge slammed his gavel several times and regained control over the court. Order, I will have order now, Mikhail Alexeyevich. You were charged with over 10,000 counts of murder and three counts of crimes against humanity, and how do you plead? The accused answer did not shock anyone. Not guilty. Before the defiance could cause any more mayhem in the court, one hour recess was called for the court to deliberate on a sentence. It would be spared out of respect for his father, but he was never returned to Russia. No mercy for this creature, he should be executed by firing squad. I like that idea, but I want to go maybe that route when we play as the army under Nikita later on, so he'll be spared out of respect for his father. 
Maybe that's a good decision, maybe that's not, but hey, it is what it is. Oh, we could use more fuel. Japanese shipments would be pretty nice. Hmm. Yeah, we might as well. I uh, like trucks. We need moderate support, low support for now. Artillery would be actually really nice to get to, but whatever. And disband the RFP. With Rozevsky vanquished and his splitters and the Magadan undefeated, it's time to prepare or, or prepare or quash the remnants of the movement. Their party, once the beating heart of the fascist movement, needs to be banned, and all those who once played key administrative and political roles in the party and the movement as a whole needs to be rounded up and put on trial. <clears throat> The most dangerous individuals should be killed and the rest in prison or put under house arrest. The wretched RFP and its adherents have been ex an existential threat to us for quite some time. <clears throat> and now that we've triumphed over them, we need to entrench ourselves as the true heirs of the white movement as it should be. For what, if, for what we have been working towards and what we've been uh, finally accomplished, I can say with certainty that it will take any action necessary to preserve it. Nice. More popularity. Or, or Technically, yes, more popularity, more political power, but less popularity for those other parties. Good. Good. Oh, go ahead and throw them in there. Good, 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 good. Oh, look at that. Oh, we core the stuff. We actually have manpower. Look at that. Who are you? Rifle off. Oh. That's uh, not bad, but... Mm. There you go. We actually have military factories. Look at that. We can build some casts, some fighters, some tanks. We're going to need some artillery and guns. Let's go two of there. Two and then two. Nice. And we have some dockyards, which we're not going to really use, except for convoys. So, we don't want to waste manpower on ships that we won't use, right? And with the next research done, about a month, not bad. March on Yakutia. Now that we've defeated the fascists and secured a position as one of the preeminent powers in the Far East, we can look outwards and prepare ourselves for what we failed to do during the Russian Civil War. Secure the unification of Russia under the White Movement. The first step towards this would be to deal with the nearby Yakut Republic. The Republic, apart from being an anti-monarchist state, controls incredibly valuable land ripe for material exploitation. Securing their territory would go a long way to ensure a steady export of valuable minerals, as well as an additional place to use... In to increase our manpower. It's probably best if we attempt to approach them first, but if that fails, the troops would be ready at the borders to prepare a hostile takeover of sorts. That way, we can at least, very least, demonstrate our goodwill, but have the Iron Fist ready underneath the Velvet Glove. Same job, different faces. Yakutia is next. We shall be ready for the tyrants and ignorance of Yakutia. And what do we have over here? Anything interesting? Looting? No? Okay. Same job, different faces. The life of a mercenary, though certainly dangerous, was equally certain to provide excitement and travel in space in spades. It was for precisely this reason that Ernesto had become one. The money far more than one can make in his native Peru did not hurt. Like many others, he had heard of opportunity in Russia. The regime that controlled the ports of Magadan were being pressured by its enemies, and he had called for fighters from abroad. Accepting the incentive payment, Ernesto found himself stepping off a boat in the port, only a few weeks later, to a land very different from those he had been in before. Truthfully, he did not like the people he worked for, but they paid very well and on time, and that was enough. And the adventure he sought was provided as well, and he had found himself quickly learning Russian, very helpful for interacting with the locals, and better understanding the shouts of the local soldiers when things got heated. And things had gotten very heated indeed. When he had been hired, his employers had failed to tell him that he would not be fighting insurgents, but rather a real army. The White Army, which had, in short order, defeated the same employers. Ernesto would survive, however, by strategically deserting when the outcome was obvious after securing his last paycheck, of course. At first, Ernesto had thought himself in trouble, but then he heard the good news. The new owners of Magadan needed manpower to secure the territory and were willing to pay for it. By the end of the day, he had again had a mercenary's commission, and carefully leaving out the fact that he had been shooting at his new employers only a week before. He hoped that this commission would last longer. If not, he could always desert again, after securing his last paycheck, of course. As long as the money kept coming, who cares? As long as the money's good, the Diamond Age owns Yaku. Oh, increased Japan Japanese support. Question of Yakut autonomy. I like that one. Maybe yeah, we'll read that one. Now that we've defeated the Yakuts and integrated their territory into Principality, we can begin to take advantage of the diamond trade. Ooh! The entire area is rich with diamonds that we can not use not only just to buy off local officials in Yakutia and elsewhere, but also to bolster our exports and help buy foreign aid. Diamonds go for guns is a pretty tantalizing offer even for the richest of nations. But the question has been raised about how exactly to go about exploiting the resources that we now control. The Yakuts were running their mines with minimal efficiency, mostly because of the lack of manpower. Luckily, we have something the Yakuts don't. Access to urban centers with populations of the listless, unemployed, and political prisoners. If we recommend these unemployed individuals and prisoners move to Yakutia to take up jobs in the mines, we'll make sure that they'll be sufficiently staffed and ultimately have our pockets lined with the money made back from diamonds. Nice, and we will go and take these guys up. Life under the Tsar, though. Sophia cautiously made her way down the walk side, doing her best not to draw attention to herself as she tried to get home with the groceries. It had never been safe to walk the streets of Zaya before the war, and she saw no reason why that would change now. Just a few minutes more, her apartment would be in sight. 
Excuse me, ma'am. Could I have a moment? The voice coming from behind stopped Sophia in her tracks. It had to be a soldier. No civilian in Zaya would stop another on the street so casually. Slowly turning around, her heart sank as her suspicions were confirmed. A young Tsar's soldier stood there, awaiting an answer. Though the uniform was different, the gun slung over his shoulder had become synonymous with oppression and abuse under the fascist regime, and she mentally prepared herself for what was to come. Apologies, ma'am, but I saw your bag and was wondering if you knew where I could find the grocer. He smiled at her apologetically. This town is like a maze, taken aback by the polite nature of the soldier's request. Sophia replied cautiously. Oh, uh, of course, it's on the corner of the intersection just ahead. Just follow the sidewalk from where I came and you can't miss it. The soldier nodded his head in response as he moved to follow her directions. Thank you, ma'am. Carry on. As the soldier departed, Sophia sighed in relief and hurriedly continued towards her apartment. Such a peaceful exchange would never happen under the fascists, who were more gangster than soldier. Sophia was still nervous about having armed men watching her every move, but perhaps things were changing for the better. Time will, of course, tell. We've got some more stability. Good. Infrastructure would be nice. Uh, let's improve relations. Now we are still low. God dang it. I thought that would improve us. Maybe we should save some political power when we integrate these guys, too. So, Not bad, though. Really not bad. I think we're doing okay. We actually have a slight reserve of manpower. We could import some fuel. How much are we getting every day? Minus 62 because we're hmm, building stuff. Keep building, 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 building. Infrastructure. <sighs> Screw it. We'll do it anyways. We're going to build up infrastructure to max it out anyways eventually. Infrastructure reserve. Oh, man. Maybe not. Yeah, we're done building up infrastructure then. And it's time for a comprehensive strategic analysis. More max planning and planning speed. Very nice. We shall march on Yakutia, which we never raided before. At least for this campaign. Oh, our GDP is looking not too bad, though. We got a few hundred million, not bad. Let's march on in. The Yakuts decline. It, it appears, either out of stupidity or bravery, that the Yakuts have declined us. We promised them all we could, but it wars upon us. Now, not that it will be much of a challenge. Our war-hardened veterans easily outnumber them. We want to be quick, however. We do not want to be bogged down in a long war, allowing our enemies to gain the upper hand. We will move quickly, as the Yakuts believe they are fighting for their very survival. And if they only understood that we were their only option to war once more, so be it. C'est la vie. Yakutic autonomy? Yakutia is nothing if not mass, a vast, rolling forest and rugged hills, all of which are covered in snow for about half the year, usually more. The Yakuts themselves are a hardy people, and are honestly not particularly predisposed to our Tsar's movement. The last thing that we need is a prolonged guerrilla conflict with natives in the middle of Siberia. While you can't force someone to love you, you can certainly buy their support. If we were to assemble a group of prominent Yakut leaders, both those who are part of the Republic and those who have been marginalized by it, we could offer them political autonomy in exchange for massive economic concessions and the recognition of Mikhail II and the Tsar. It may not necessarily be the best of deal for them, nor would it be pleased, or would it please our hardliners, but it would have tangible benefits for all sides. Cool. Yeah, we have another division we could deploy. Uh, would you guys like to move a little faster? That would be nice. Yeah, they're still moving, so you guys come up to Yakutsk. And that should be pretty good. We have another soldier to deploy. Nice. Good job, guys. Good job. Anything else here? Ooh, we want more loot. Yes, we want more loot. Investments would not be bad, but let's save political power for this. We're doing pretty darn well with divisions. God dang. Oh. Holy crap. That, that was a fast South African war. Maybe I just wasn't paying attention, but jeez Louise. Did we just get 2.38? Nice. Come on. Get in there, boys. Get in there. Don't let them hold their horses against us. Uh, you can just help out there, I guess, since you're not doing too much. Nice. Oh. Camarobo. Wow. Good job, Camarobo. Wow. We're we'll going to keep building up our industry if we possibly can. Industry next. Thank you. And we'll do some resources eventually, too. Oh, we need more fuel. Uh, let's, let's trade for one thing of fuel. Uh, sure. Very nice. Beautiful, my friends. Absolutely beautiful. Now uh, prepared against Alden. Nice. Now the big, biggest word we have here in the Far East is that uh, uh, stability, manpower. Oh, let's go with Diamond Age. <clears throat> is the the Amalan group? Amalan, the, the divine mandate of Siberia, which will probably not be super easy, but hey, what is what it is. We could probably buy some more support. Why not? Why is it still low? How many times do we have to do this to appease them? Ah, nice. Hopefully we'll get that up and we'll do Yakut autonomy next. Yeah, let's get more fuel, 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 fuel for the fuel gods. I need to play this awesome someday. Nice. Scam for loot. Thank you. Implement the raid. And actually, refuse tribute. Of course they would. Hey, moderate support. Raid successful. Great job, guys. And we shall do uh, agricultural methods. Yes, please. Anything else here? Import Japanese trucks. How many motorized divisions or things? Oh, we got plenty of trucks. 
Food for the hungry. If you'd like to read about this, please go right ahead. Stability, war support, and political power. Sign us up. Yes, please. Reinforce the borders. To our west, the rump state of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics still perpetuate, scraping by a miserable existence and attempting desperately to enforce the dictatorial socialist agendas. However, the Soviets admittedly do have fairly impressive armed forces, when, if not, we come into conflict with the Reds. It is of the utmost importance that we find ourselves prepared. One of the ways that has been suggested to do so, at, or just do that, would be to construct fortifications along the western border. This will ensure that when the time comes, the Red Tide will crash against the cliffs of our invincible bunkers and trenches. Our stalwart defenders will not give an inch to the socialists, providing or proving the degree of discipline that we have inspired among our troops. Remember, the ice march. Never again will we flee from the oncoming socialists. The question of Yakut autonomy. As expected, our troops encountered a minimal resistance during the hostile takeover of Yakutia, and the vast territory is now under our protection of both the Transbaikal Principality and the Tsar. We must now answer the question of what to do with it. Yakutia is enormous and densely forested, and our army is far too small to maintain strict control. Sir Mikhail has uncharacteristically broken his usual silence to offer a potential solution. He seems to think that compromise will ensure its stability in the region, and that it would be prudent to give a certain degree of autonomy to the people of Yakutsk on the grounds that they pledge their support to us. Would promising a friendly Yakut government be a wise move, or prefer to have a direct annexation to our territories? We establish a royal occupation government. Their land belongs to us now. We'll do that one. Why not? More stability. We shall... Oh, we... that's the maximum amount of stability we can get right now. That sucks. Because we were at 45 earlier, now we're still stuck at 45. Import Japanese trucks. We can wait. There you go. Shipunov will lead us for now. Reinforce the borders after that. Ottoman's legacy. Stocking up. Uh, we want to keep this for as long as possible. So stocking up. While we were successful against the fascists, it has now become clear that our army is not equipped to the optimal levels despite all of our efforts. This is a simple logistical problem. Easily solvable with mathematics. We have guns, jackets, and ammo, but our soldiers don't. It's time to take stock and distribute what we have to our troops to make sure that our army is well equipped before we head west and end the Soviet serpent. For a while, the fascists proved a threat. The Soviets, their ideology entrenched in those they rule over, provide a threat ten times as great, if not more. It is, it is this reality that we must address, and our soldiers must be worth five of theirs, and even then, their fighting spirit and faith in the Tsar will ensure victory. However, the only way of realistically achieving that is to make sure that the, every soldier is equipped to the best of our abilities. Gods of the North. Oh boy. Um, if you'd like to read about this, this happens every single time the... the Divine Mandate as a spirit forms, so if you'd like to read about this, please go right ahead, but we must prepare for this new threat. Unfortunate, but yes. Uh, we have 30 factories, which is pretty darn nice, actually. Support equipment. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and make two and start converting some of our divisions over, maybe, if we have enough manpower, of course. So you guys are the three divisions. You guys are going to hit really hard, hopefully. Nice. If we need to, go ahead and do that, maybe. Reinforce the borders. Stocking up. Is there anything else here we can do? Um, not really. We already had a successful raid. So, I guess we'll read the Ottoman's legacy. The death of our beloved Ottoman is still fresh in the minds of all those in the principal team. From the Tsar himself to the lowliest of peasants, Semenyov was the white movement. He personified it, lived it, built it. Without the Ottoman's strong rule and decades of delicate political maneuvering in Habin, there will be no principality, no Tsar Mikhail II, and most likely the white movement would have been subsumed to the RP long ago. However, the Ottoman's most significant contributions to the white movement were militaristic. He had organized the first white army during an original foray back into Siberia, and had personally coordinated the entire Harbin front, and until the fascist traders split it and dis disintegrated any hope we had of securing ourselves the whole of Russia. And even then, during our darkest hour, it was Semenyov who took the reins of power in rallying the loyalists around Chita, ensured that the survival of the white movement hail Semenyov, eternal servant of the Tsar. An ultimatum. If you like to read about this, please go right ahead, but we must be prepared against him. So stop training, get your butts over to the line, and hopefully we can help defend against these evil, evil religious folks. And they're not evil because they're religious, they're just crazy. We have 11 days. Oh yeah, we're not going to have a lot of time to move our guys around. But Chita's looking very fortified, hopefully. Well, maybe not. Okay, then. There goes Speer. Goodbye, Speer. Hope you have a good time in prison. Maybe you can go to the USA, but we'll see what happens. We do have a loot. That's kind of nice. Come on, get our boys over there. Some of the guys already have a little bit of organization, which is nice. Four days. Come on, come on, get over there. I'm not sure where they're attacking from, but... Oh, the Hadrish, no! Well, we will not back down so easily. Oh, God, it had to be this one. It had to be this, the farthest one away. Are you kidding me? Can we spend it? Come on, please let us spend it first. Okay, we're defending. Okay, that's good. Woof. How strong is this division? Oh, the militia. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. They're stacking up more soldiers. Come on, boys. Move, 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 move. Stocking up. Got Mons Legacy. There's nothing we can do about this now. So, you got to watch and see. Japanese trucks improve relations. Maybe we'll do that soon, but we'll wait. 
the Far Eastern Reclamation. Ooh, focus tree changes. Now that our troops are stocked, our territory pacified, and our administration prepared, we can finally look west with a realistic plan. Mikhail's advisors, in reality the decision makers of the nation, have come up with the Far Eastern Reclamation Plan. A series of conquests as well as a unified strategy for dealing with the communists, ultimately looking to establish our control over all the Far East. This plan was only briefly discussed with the Tsar, but was largely kept in the dark <clears throat> about the military matters. That being said, however, he was briefed on what he needed to say on the radio for the speech that he had encouraged to give, him to give. The Far Eastern Reclamation Plan contained both militaristic and propagandist elements. To defeat the communists on the field is not enough. We have to win the hearts, the minds of those that have systematically oppressed in the name of their twisted ideology. Nice. Cool. We actually won. Good job, guys. Um, with that being said, we can do stuff over there. Uh, I would really love to beat up Irkutsk first before we go to war with those guys, so. Hold. And I suppose we can increase relations again. We're still moderate. I don't want to spend too much political power. I want to save some of it. Investments would not be bad. 65. It's not terrible. We could use more military factories, but we're doing actually okay on weaponry. Right? Wow, we got a lot of anti-tank. Are we missing anything besides manpower? No, not really. The Ottoman's legacy, which we love, the Ottoman. Far Eastern Reclamation. More manpower. Good, finally. And more war support. Look at that war support. It's beautiful, my friends. Um, who can we raid? N neither group has money. Oh, what happened to Aldon? Aldman. Aldon. Oh, they ate him up. Not. Oh, good. Keep, suck on that resistance, you piece of garbage. Suck on it. Mm, how many divisions do they have? Oh, that's a lot of manpower. They have up to six. We have 11. If we can move fast enough, we could probably destroy them. I would love to either fight one on one first. So, we got to rush towards that. Scavenge for loot. Good, 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 good. Oh, we can raid these guys too. Um, honestly, I think we'll just wait. Let's not raid them. They're pretty far away. They don't have that many divisions. We could probably win two, but... Mm. Get that manpower, boys. Beautiful. Oh. Oh. Oh! Let's open up. If you're about the invasion of Aldon, please go right ahead. But remember Red October. War in the North. We gotta do remember Red October. Remember Red October. Remember Anastasia and Alexei Nikolaevich killed his children who begged and pleaded for their lives. Remember all the depraved actions taken by the so-called liberators in the name of the revolution. How have the decades of communism treated the Russian people? There's no legacy of the communists outside of failure, and yet they still claim to retain the mandate to rule over the masses. Do not trust a communist who seeks to impress a Russian, or oppress a Russian, I mean, and institute his ideology at every level of society. Today, Tsar Mikhail gave a speech that broadcasted throughout his domain on the matters of the communists, in an attempt to arouse the masses against the communists and better prepare both the home front and the armies for the great conquest in the West. The speech was surprisingly impassioned and received quite well among our people. S. Namibog. And we gotta make sure we got enough planes here. Actually, we have a, f a few planes. Literally, a few planes. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Good, 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 good. I want to beat up the comments. Hopefully, we can do that by the end of this episode. With slight, slight amount of air superiority. But, you know what? Every slight amount helps out. Alright, after that. Uh, invasion of Baratia. No, we gotta do this one. End of the Union. The Union of Soviet Social Republics, or rather the Trump State Base in Irkutsk, held together by a mad hatchet man's paranoia and pure force of wills, representative of all that is dangerous to the Russian people. Many of our soldiers have begun repeating a saying that they've learned from their American mercenary peers, better dead than red. In this case, it is most certainly true. The Union has poisoned the minds and lives of the Russian people for decades, and this decrepit remnant of communism, holding itself together by the skin of its teeth, is finally within reach of the valiant troops' bayonets. The general staff has already drawn up a war plan and written a speech. For the Tsar wants the right army rules the streets of Irkutsk. The troops are ready. Their morale high. Our mercenaries are paid. Pockets lined with Yakut diamonds. What better time than now to simultaneously decapitate the social serpent and legitimize our rule over the Far East? We gotta be quick, though. Um, we're almost done here. We can prepare a raid. No. Oh, we got this too. Good. We've been really hammering home on our land auction. I love it. Just blazing through this. Oh, invasion of Baratia. Oh, if you'd like to review that, please go right ahead. Nice. Cool. And workers' facilities. We have, uh, have we done research facilities. We need to do basic literacy again. It's not going up as fast as we'd like to. So new schools, why not? Because we need a lot of political power for all this area. So another division. Uh, what is the divine mandate doing? They have a little bit of manpower. And the th the sins of our roots. Oh, come Chaka. Okay, that's good. Oh, that's good. Um, if you'd like to read about this, go right ahead. I think this happens every single time, so, as well. The Lord's Word, and that is what we will serve. Cool. End of the Union. Oh, Olympic Games, War in the North. Is it War with Cheetah? We gotta wait for that. 
Uh, and the Union owns Irkutsk, Trial for the Revolutionaries. Let's do this one. The Paris of Siberia. The city of Irkutsk, long considered one of the most developed city in Siberia, has fallen long since into disrepair following the collapse of the Union and the relocation of Genrik Yagoda's terror state there. However, in reality, the city was once an industrial giant, far greater than her capital, Cheetah, and as such, we should begin funding the redevelopment of the city to ensure that it can not only attain its previous level of development, infrastructure, and industry, but also that we can take advantage of it as well. Both God and the Tsar know how important it is to have as much industry available to us in the upcoming months and years, pumping out military weapons and ammo for the ever-hungry war machine. We must restore the Paris of Siberia to her former glory. Good. And we are at war. Trucks, arm shipments. Well, we could do that eventually. So much moderate. Eh, we can do it once more. And how many guns do we have? We need more cast, of course, but that, what else do we need? Oh, we don't need more guns. That's good. Can we just, like, roll on in, maybe? Actually, I need to take you guys. Go to Alden. Go there. Uh, uh, you go there and just cut them off as well. Where are the trucks? Or the truck division? Go here and circle them if you can. There you go. That'll be good. We should be able to do this relatively quickly, maybe, but... They have up to eight divisions. We have 12, so... Sometimes it's just worth having more divisions. Oh, you hold. Don't don't worry about going in yet. Just hold for now. And you guys go all the way to Bob Bob de Bo Bo de Bo. That's kind of cool. Bo de Bo Bo de Bo Bo de Bo. Nice, good job, guys. Oh, they're trying to cut us off as well. We'll see what happens. Borman wins the civil war. Well, I mean, who saw that one coming? I probably did. You probably did as well. Kermova units to the group. Cool, good for you. They're probably try going to try to cut us off. That's all right. Yep, they've already done that, so be it. But soon enough, we'll have our supplies back, and we will kill them off. How's the stuff looking? Not great. Okay. Uh, what the heck are you guys doing? Get down there. And go there. Oh, cheetahs. Oh. Well, you know what? You guys are going straight for a coup. Screw everyone else. Uh, go through there first, though. So. Let the infantry do the encirclements and such, so. Nice. Keep moving in, boys. You're doing a great job. Not sure what these guys are doing up there, but we'll catch up to them. Beat them up. Oh, if you'd like to read about... Never mind, I'm, I might as well read it. Wow! Holy crap, that was the fastest we've ever, I've ever taken out Rakutsk. With the city of Rakutsk recently taken by our Siberian armies, the mighty hydroelectric stations come under our control, constructed under the orders of Genrik Yagoda after the Soviet Union was pushed back to the corners of Siberia. This work of infrastructure has reliably generated energy for the entire city under its command. A mighty symbol of the Russian mastery over nature, the Rakutsk hydroelectric power station may also be a symbol of our control over the Siberian frontiers amidst the chaos of warlordism in the east. Given the immense amounts of electricity gathered from the currents of the river, we can utilize the potential of the hydroelectric station of send power to our manufacturing plants, factories, and homes of the citizens living within our territory. The concrete station towered over the Siberian wastes and churned through great amounts of Angara's waters to generate electricity. We will utilize the natural veins of our fractured nation, and with such a magnificent source of electricity in the region, our energy supplies will never, ever run dry. This will surely aid our efforts. Beautiful. That was actually, that's probably literally the easiest time I've ever taken out Irkutsk. Jesus, just let your motorized go, and they'll run through everything. Jesus. Um, at this point, I'm going to go and convert. Let's see. You guys are already looking pretty good. I want 20 combat with because fate Kamarobo will not be easy. I'm pretty, I'm more than certain that under work, work I've heard is actually extremely powerful, or can be extremely powerful, I should really say. Oh, we need more guns. Oh, that's not good. Uh, on of course, the first. Hold on. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, arm shipments? No. We're kind of, oh, actually, we probably could use that. But let's do the Paris of Siberia like we did earlier. And free military factories. Go five. Go one. Go five. And go five as well. Nice, my friends. This is really great. I love it. And train when you need to. We no longer need this type of division, but... Uh, go and cast them out. Uh, and then you guys. We have enough for this. Uh, just go back to... Uh, where is it? Light infantry. There you go. Nice. Just because light infantry does not require anti-tank. And anti-tank sometimes can be a pain in the butt to make. So, ultimately, we'll need less anti-tank. But we'll need more manpower and, and support equipment. So, I'd rather use extra factories for, like, tanks and stuff. So, nice. Mercenary infantry. Literally mercenary infantry. So, that's really good. And eventually, we will make 40 combo with division. So, we'll get there eventually. Uh, train. Two at a time. An eye for an eye. Having ordered the executions of countless men over the many years, Genrik Yagoda knew what was coming. He knew in the moment of the reports of the collapse of the Red Army's positions outside Irkutsk had arrived. The White Army had entered soon after. 
<clears throat> the following days have been spent in a cell, one of his own, while the decision on his fate were made, far above and away from his current position. It took him far longer than he thought, the product, no doubt, of the confused and inefficient nature of the white-led government that had been once reported by the NKVD, but there was, in truth, only one possible choice, and it had finally been made. When the door is open, your go to stood. He resolved to meet his end in a dignified as fashion as possible, not like the so many supposedly strong men he had seen collapse into primor primal terror when their end approached. It was gripped strongly all the same and was led through the same underground passages and up the stairs, finally emerging in the building's courtyard where a stanchion had been erected in front of the one wall. In front of it stood a large party of soldiers and officers waiting for this placement. Too many people, you gotta thought. There was a reason he had always ordered men shot in the dark basement. It prevented people from knowing just what had happened, which therefore prevented any attribution to martyrdom. The knowledge that his name would be would endure long past this moment was small, some small comfort, but it was still comfort, or a sort of. In his last moments, he was fastened to the post. You go to fell. Felt something he had never felt before. Not fear, but apprehension. Apprehension for what came next. He wondered if all men in such a position felt the same, and then the command was given, and you go to was, and felt no more. A triumph decades in the making. Uh, good job, man. We took out one communist tyrant. Many more will come along, though. Uh, cool. The July tragedy averted. Fill the imperial treasury. I like that one. With the control over Alden and its environs and secured, we can finally begin maximizing our exploitation of the gold mines by expanding our makeshift prisoner scheme inherited. <clears throat> initiated by the Yakutian diamond mines, we can not only ensure enough labor, but a surplus of manpower for the mines, after all. What is the consequence of a few casualties from the undesirables and a pursuit of profit? Some others would have suggested that using the defeated Alden partisans as labor as well, which may be an option. Either way, it's imperative that we begin to exploit the precious metals in our new region, and the more money, the better, after all. Money makes the world go round, and we know that most definitely. Grand principle to the Central Siberian Mandate. Wait, what? Can we actually raid you guys? They have a bunch of manpower. Wow. We could potentially raid them. You know what? This is probably not going to go well for us, but we could try it. Maybe they'll pay tribute. You never know. We'll try it. Why not? I got you get over there quickly enough, and we shall do Travels for the Revolutionaries. Now that we have triumphed over Salblin and his followers, we can begin the proceedings of how to precisely deal with them. The atmosphere in the capital is akin to the very earliest days of the White Movement, when our brave soldiers and officers cried out for justice and revenge, truly hearkening back to the October Revolution and its consequences, is just is a just outcome for those looking to create a parallel between themselves and the old Bolsheviks. A group of white officers and generals based in Cheetah has suggested a number of outcomes for Salblin and his fellow revolutionaries, although it seems like the general consensus is that their fate should... In imitate the fate of the state Tsar Nikolai II when his family shot without trial or warning by the Bolsheviks at the height of the Civil War. While some protest that the move is too merciful, it seems that the best way to proceed after a long, fair trial, of course, something never afforded to the Romanovs. Cool. Scan for loot, and we'll see what happens. The July Tragedy Avenged. The July Tragedy, the execution of the Romanov family with no trial, warning, or civility has been a long, been a black mark on the white movement. A feeling of collective guilt has been long badgered by those at the very height of the white movement. However, with the capture of Irkutsk and the end of our ideological enemies in the Far East by our own hands, we can finally free ourselves from the burden of this guilt. The deaths of the communists and their followers, and the beginning of our decommunization of Irkutsk and beyond has meant that we can finally find cause for celebration. Mikhail II has actually made a good suggestion. A wicked celebration and holiday to mark the end of the Bolshevik rule. While some of officers were initially hesitant, the bread and games approach to winning over the people has frequently proven to be most effective. Which is good. And we have technology. We can do. Nice. We're doing really, really well. Um, supply grades. That stuff is okay. We'll grab strategic cycles because they help us out immediately first. Oh, and let's stop trading too because we're going to need as much organization as possible for this. We're going to need a lot. Oh, actually, we've got enough guns for a while. Oh, Pacific Fleet's gun. Oh, that's not good. That's not good. Main battle tanks. We're slowly making some of those as well. Great. Anti-tank. We're looking pretty good on everything but planes. Of course. Of course. Let's go and do a raid, maybe, perhaps. And... Two is good. Two is good. Two is good. I want to make more planes. And tanks, but planes first. Ooh, this might be a big old risk we're going to take here. Never mind. Rurk the second is a weak old man who has nothing for his people. Amalan, you're next. Magadan. Beautiful. Hopefully they don't attack us too quickly. Hopefully we'll get a, a warning that he will attack. What is he doing next? Um, 6,000 manpower, 5 to 7 divisions. We have 13, so... All one in Christ. You bet your butts you're all one in Christ. Execution of Valerie Salbin. Um... I don't want to. I didn't want to do that, but okay. 
Oh, I don't want to execute him. <clears throat> Any last words, Bolshevik? Valerie Soblin, now disheveled, defeated shell of his former appearance, looked up at his captors. The guns were now trained on him, and there was no, not a doubt in Soblin's mind that they intended to do. Speak, Red, you won't get another chance. This time, Soblin decided to humor their daunting demands. So, this is what it's come to. The war is lost, and I'm to die in this dusty basin for my trouble. It's funny. I always thought I'd be executed by the NKVD. Not by some Tsarist relics. Selvin attempted to stand up straight and look at his executioners in the eyes. It was harder than it looked, for the would-be revolutionary was greeted weak, greatly weakened from his time in captivity. You Tsarist dudes think killing me is going to end the revolution? Have you learned nothing? The people of Russia will never accept a reactionary monarch. Soon enough, they'll remember uh, all over again while the revolution happened. And when that day comes, another will rise in my place to avenge me and the rest of my comrades. Do your worst, but know that it's going to take a lot more than killing me to crush the revolutionary spirit of the people. This isn't over by a long... Without warning, the impatient Tsarist executioners opened fire and prematurely ended Salvin's defiant last speech. The force of the rifle ca rounds caused Salvin to fall backwards against the wall. As his body slid down to the floor, the young revolutionary drew his last breath, and Salvin's execution had finally brought the socialist movement and the Russian Far East to a tragic close, and symbolically heralded the ascendancy of the white movement. Good. That's, I don't want to kill him, but we'll read finally with the war in the north. The perfidious, heretical preacher base in the north has done much to disrupt our unification efforts. Going so far as to invade our territory and rouse the peasants against us, Alexander Men is little more than a jacked up priest, squatting in freezing churches, and yet somehow each of his followers fight with the zeal of a dozen disciplined soldiers. We need to deal with the poisonous preacher as soon as possible. With the poisonous preacher as soon as possible. For if we don't, who knows how far his influence will reach? He's certainly popular with the rural populations, and rumors abound that his agents have already infiltrated our churches and factories. Action must be taken, both military and political, to make sure that we maintain stability in these trying times and that we extinguish the possibility that men's soldiers have a fighting chance against their own. The ruling council must be assembled and actions decided upon. Call an emergency meeting and hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow when we'll reunify the Far East and prepare against the other part of Siberia. Thanks for watching, and have a tremendous, tremendous rest of your day.